Lord, we come before you humbly this morning. We're here to worship you in this place, God. I pray that as, as we sing your praises, God, that our hearts and our minds, Lord, would start tuning into your frequencies, Lord, that we could hear and we could press in and we could step deeper and deeper into your midst, God, that we could come closer, Lord, that we could rest, rest in you this morning, God, that we could hear the fresh word of God this morning, Lord, that we drink it, drink it up, Lord, because like, like a deer longing for water, Lord, our soul thirsts for you, God. So I pray that you would pour it out heavy this morning, God, that we could drink and be overflowing with your spirit. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Should we stand and join us as we worship this morning? Sing to the King. To Jesus, the Lamb that was slain, life and salvation, life and salvation, his empire, his empire shall bring joy to the nations, and joy to the nations, and when Jesus is King. Sing to the King. Jesus is King. So come, let us sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. Lift up a heart of praise, sing now with voices raised to Jesus. For his return, for his return, and we watch and we pray. We will be ready in the dawn of that day. Satan is vanquished and Jesus is King. So come, let us sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. And he's all we need. Lift up a heart of Sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus, and He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise, sing now with voices raised to Jesus, and sing to the King. Man, hallelujah. Yes, God, we declare that we belong to you this morning, God. We lift up our voices in praise to you this morning, God. We worship you in this place. We worship the lion and the lamb. God, who is like him, our Lord God Almighty. He's coming on the clouds. Every 
chain will break. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the light, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting the battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Yes, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Every knee will bow. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God, the God who comes to save, is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion. He's roaring with power and fighting the battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting the battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Yes, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, oh, oh. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting the battles. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Yes, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. No. God, we thank you that your blood does break the chains, God. It's through your sacrifice that we're standing here before you, King Jesus. Words can't describe how thankful we are that all those years ago, while I was your enemy, Lord, you sent your son to die for me, that I might be adopted into your sonship, an 
heir to your throne. My brothers and sisters, we praise you. We give you praise and honor in this place this morning. And your heart is 
all that I desire And not my will But yours alone forever And here's my life Have your way And here's my life And have your way And here's my life And have your way God, we surrender to your presence this morning. Leave us abandoned to your presence as we worship you, Lord. Save by mercy. Save by mercy. We found in your grace. Totally surrender to your embrace. And there's nothing more than you. See your perfection. I'm lost in your peace. Your faithfulness sings over me. Hallelujah. 
telling Rod this morning, sometimes as a pastor, I wonder how much, how much of what God has shown me do I share with you? How much, how much do you really need to know? How much is helpful for you? I want you to understand this, where we are going, where He intends to take us, holiness will be required. It just will. Just will. I was struck this morning as we were worshiping between a couple of different songs. I exalt thee. I do. I exalt him. I lift him up. This is a choice I make. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, David said. There's another song. Take me in to the holy place. It's a place that Jesus made a way for me to enter into, but you understand to enter into that holy place requires holiness. He needs to take me in by the blood of the Lamb. I must receive the blood. I must receive what Jesus did. Chapter 6 of Isaiah, he sees God. And he says, woe is me, I'm a man undone. I've seen the Lord. I'm a man of unclean lips and a people of unclean lips. See, the, the look on the face of God is certain death. And one of the seraphim come and they touch his lips with a coal and say, see, your sin is removed. We are a people of unclean lips. We're a people who play church on Sunday and then on Monday go back to our regular lives. It's not really holiness, it's hypocrisy. I'm not here to beat you up. My life isn't perfect. I just want you to know where we're going requires holiness. And he's going to take us there because he's the only one who can. Praise the Lord. Oh, I just have no idea where we're going today. I know where I plan to go. I just don't know where we're going now. Father, seal up in us this morning the things that you've done for us. Father, seal up the healings that came this morning and the 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 healings that came from brokenness. Father, let brokenness over our sin have its work. Help us, Father, to be a people who repent and come to you. Help us come to our senses like the prodigal son did and begin to make our way home. Father, we need your help. In Jesus' name. I think what we'll do, want to, you want to cue up that video? Um, 
Most of you know that we, uh, as a church, had sowed into uh, the church that's in Tanzania. I wanted to share with you this morning, uh, over the last week or so, week and a half, the pastor there has been sending me video clips of the progress they've been making. And so I want to share those with you this morning as we prepare to take tithes and offerings. I'll just share. I want you to see what you have had part in. I just I want you to see what you're doing in the nations. Go ahead and go ahead and play that. This is where they began digging the trench for the foundation. Now they put the rocks in. This will become the base of the foundation. They're slowly complete, completing it. It's got a couple videos here. These are the bricks that they made to ah, it's not coming through the right spot. It's coming through the TV. Can you? All right, well, we don't have time to change it. I just want you to uh, I just want you to see they have now set the foundation and uh, he's showing us what's done. They begin to fill in the sections, and and this is the last picture of the the guy. So now they they have the foundation done, and they've filled it all in. And he calls this guy the engineer, which I get a great kick out of. Uh, what he's doing, obviously, is he's beginning to set the first course of bricks. In his video, he thanks the church for the things that we were able to do to help them. That area over there, the far end, that'll be the the reception center. And now, this in, in just a short period of time, the work is pretty much completed. That's what it looks like from the outside. They've gone up all the way up to the top. would have been more fun with the audio, but hey. You can see they made room for a couple of windows. And then it'll take us inside, and I want you to see that too. So what they'll do, the next, the next layer, once they get this done, then they'll put a uh, a coating over the top of it, like we would plaster things, they, they actually cement them. So this is the inside. This will be the area that will be for reception. And this will be the office. That's the back of the church before, and now this will be a new part of it. And then this... This will be the washroom. And he says, we thank God for this. It's odd to me that they haven't cut any holes or run any pipes yet, but I guess the engineer knows what he's doing. And then he shows this upper part. They, they have to plaster or they, they, they go over it with a cement sand mixture. They have to add this part before they can put the roof on because you can't put it on later. So what they have up to this point is they have the walls up. And this is a big deal for them. They are super jazzed about this. And at the end he said, please tell the congregation, greet your members. That's what he calls you. Greet the members and tell them thank you so much for what they've done. So we took a small gift and they put an addition on their church with a small gift there's no roof on it yet there's no windows the part I wanted to convey to you the part that I think is the most important I knew they didn't have windows in this church and it gets it gets cold there and in the summertime it gets hot there and so we had taken the gift with the intention of them putting in windows. That would have been the most logical, in my opinion, choice. But when you give a gift, it doesn't come with strings, right? 
It doesn't come with a, this is what this is for. We gave a gift. And they felt that the best use of their money was to put an addition on the church. Well, so I told him, no, you can't do that. We need all the money back because you're not doing it our way. <laughs> you see how foolish that sounds? When, when you give, give without strings. When you give, you give unto the Lord. And what that means is you don't get to judge what happens with the gift after the gift is given. Does that make sense to you? Yes. See, we, we, live, we live in a society where you give me a gift and I wait an appropriate amount of time and return it to get what I wanted. Or you give me a gift and I put it in a box and re-gift it later. Because I want what I want. That's not what tithes and offerings are. What you give to the Lord is dead to you now. I don't know if you know, in the, in the Old Testament, see, the firstborn belongs to God. That was his. And so he said, the firstborn of the animals just break their neck. That's mine. Well, no, let's not. I mean, that's like a valuable animal. It's, it's not yours. It's his. And when you give an offering, it's not yours. It actually has to die to you. Because once it dies to you, then it can produce fruit. Does that make sense? So, I probably wouldn't have put an addition on, although I was all for the new toilet. I think that's an awesome addition. But it's not my call to make. So now they will get together with the other believers in their church, and they will begin to trust God for the roof. And they'll believe for uh, the cement to get the sides down, then they'll put the roof on, and who knows? Someday maybe they'll trust God and they'll get the windows. That's between God and them. I just wanted you to see the impact that you have had there. And that's because of your faithful giving. Father, I bless your people in Jesus' name. Thank you for them. Father, I pray that you would remove from this house poverty. I pray, Father, you would remove from this house debt. I pray, Father, that you would make us a people who have all sufficiency in all things so that we can be a blessing on every occasion. In Jesus' name, amen. I think sometimes we forget, you know, it's like, yeah, good Samaritan. He was a good guy, wasn't he? You know, stepped in, took care of things. The only reason he could do that is because he had sufficiency. If he hadn't had the money to have the ability to do the things he did, he could, wouldn't have been able to do them even if he wanted to. Right? He goes, he takes, takes the guy who'd been beat up, he takes him to an inn and says, take care of his needs, and when I return, whatever additional cost you have, I'll take care of that too. You can't do that if you don't have resources. At that point, you can just say, hey, I wish you were warm and well filled. We need to do better than that. And I just want you to know, as a church, we are, we are doing our best to tangibly meet the needs of people. Oh, praise God. Let's turn this morning to Acts chapter 27, verse 31. Oh, I still like hearing the sound of pages flip. Acts chapter 27, verse 31. And then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Let's pray. Father, help me today in Jesus' name. Father, help me not to go beyond. Father, what... You desire me to share. Help me, Father, not to go beyond what's written. Help me, Father, to stay in step this morning with Holy Spirit. Help me, Father, to reveal truth and life to your people. Father, and help, help them to be equipped and prepared for the hour that we are in. Father, we need your help. In Jesus' name. Told you before, I'm I'm one of those guys. I don't I don't 
Sometimes we end up doing series. The last few weeks we've kind of been doing a series. I'm, I'm not big on series, but sometimes I've got so much to say I just can't fit it all in this little half-hour chunk I get. I want the fresh word of the Lord. I don't want to hear, I don't want to prepare something nine months ahead. I want to hear what God's saying today. And this week, God has been speaking the same word over to me and over and over and in different situations and in all these different ways. And he keeps saying the same thing. Stay with the boat. Stay with the boat. I believe it's a prophetic word. I believe it's for us as a church. I believe it is for the church at large. And I want to deliver it to you in that vein as a prophetic word. Now, to understand the what's going on, I want you, I want you to consider what's happened to Paul at this point in his life when, when he makes the statement we just read. He's, he's on a ship and he's headed to Rome. He has already been told a number of times by the Lord that he would be preaching in Rome. God made it very clear. You will speak before Caesar. You'll find a reference in Acts 19.21. You'll find it again in 23.11. And in this passage that we're talking about now, you're going to find it once again. This is Acts 27. There's no question, no question, Paul would stand before Caesar and speak. It was going to happen. The full forces of hell itself could not stop this event from happening. God had appointed it. It was a divine appointment. I want you to understand something about divine appointments. They do not guarantee an easy trip. What a divine appointment guarantees is that it will happen. And it did happen. So, where we pick up here in Acts 27, this is now the third time Paul has been told, you will go to Rome and preach. In fact, I, let's just look quickly at verses 23 and 24 out of this chapter. It's Paul speaking, he's sharing with the shipmates who have decided they're just going to die. I mean, it's really, it's gotten this bad. Luke writes a little earlier, said, we have given up all hope. Friends, as Christians, that is not something we do. We do not give up all hope. Verse 23, Last night the angel of the God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul, for you must stand trial before Caesar. Now listen. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. On this night, in the middle of this absolutely terrible storm, God speaks to Paul. And he just reminds him, I'm going to bring you through this. I'm going to, I've already made a promise. You're coming through this. And I'm going to graciously give you the lives of all who sail with you, too. Well, got to tell you, that's pretty good news for the heathens on the boat. So I want you to understand something. None of them had a guarantee they would be going to Rome. One guy in that boat had the guarantee. One guy. God said, I will give you their lives as well. Paul's life was secure. He had a word three times given him. Now he has a word that the others won't die either. But there's a caveat. So long as they stay with the boat. I want you to understand, friends, when God gives a prophetic word, it's serious business. It's not an opportunity for you to choose either or. It's a direction. Now, let's skip on down to verse 29. And what I want you to remember here is that as we read this, we're dealing with seasoned professionals. Right? These sailors, this is their life. This is what they do. These are men who understand what's going on. In verse 29, and fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they, that's the sailors, dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. And then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. 
So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. I don't know if you caught what he said. He said, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. I want to, I want to read that out of the New Living just because I think it, I think its meaning gets lost. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, you will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. That's impactful. See, God is an orchestrator of all things, and, and he knows the beginning from the end. He appoints the end of all matters. In this case, he had appointed a path for those on the boat to be saved. And that's logical if you think about it. See, to bring a ship in, in that kind of a situation, it was going to require the expertise and the experience of those sailors. Either that or God would need to do a supernatural miracle. And he could do either one. He chose to save everybody's life. So God appoints salvation for the entirety of the boat. What we need to remember is the events. These are in God's hands. But the duty to act in accordance with his direction well, that's often in our hands. The choice that they had on that boat was simple that day. Trust God or make your own way. That's a, that's a choice you and I face almost every day. Trust God or make my own way. Now, sailors in this case felt that they were better off making their own way. I don't know this God of Paul, and I don't know how things are going to work out with him. But Paul had made it pretty clear. If you leave the boat, God is no longer obligated. If you leave the boat, many are going to die. They needed to stay with the boat. This is the word that God's been speaking to me this, this whole week. Friends, you and me, we need to stay with the boat mentioned to you a couple of times before, and I, I don't know, maybe you just think I'm just one of those crazy charismatic pastors. The cloud is moving. It is moving. God is moving. There's a storm coming. And I, I don't mean to scare you with that, but there is a storm coming. A storm that's coming. It isn't what you think it's going to be. It's not a, it's not a test like that. It's going to be a violent clash of two worlds, of this world and of the kingdom of God. It's a, it's a test that's, or a, 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 not a test, a storm. It's going to be maybe a little bit more violent than people are expecting, and, and frankly, than most people are ready for. It's a spiritual storm. And again, I don't say this to bring fear. I don't want you to be fearful because God has arranged safe passage for us. But he's orchestrated that safe passage. And if you're going to receive that safe passage, you need to stay with the boat. And not the boat of your choosing. Right? They were going to let down the lifeboat and they were going to get away in that. And if they had, they'd have died. And then the sailors not being in the boat. Others would have died. And God would have worked a miracle and he would have saved Paul because his word isn't going to fail. It's best for the sailors to stay with the boat. And, and the centurion, the soldiers, they understood that. And so they took the boat out of the equation. It's not going to happen. By nature, men are selfish. And often we're quite arrogant. Sailors were not new at this. They knew the boat was probably their best odds, that little lifeboat. They think they knew a safer way. They think they knew a better way. Oftentimes in our lives, we think we know a better way. We see what God is doing. It's like, I ain't, I ain't doing that. And so we try to navigate a new way. Trust me. Please hear me. You won't navigate what lies ahead without it. You just won't. 
you're going to need to stay with the boat. And so the logical question is, well, what does it mean to stay with the boat? I don't know what that means. It's simple. Stay where he's called you. He's called you. Many of you he's called here. You need to stay where he's called you, and you need to be doing what he called you to do. Maybe maybe you haven't been paying attention. Take a minute. Step back. Look at the bigger picture. If you're paying attention, he's been moving people. He's been orchestrating people's lives. He's taken people out of one church and moved them to another church. He's taken people out of one town and moved them to another town. Out of one state and moved them to another state. He is setting up his chessboard. He's setting it up. You today might be here because he called you out of one place and moved you to another place. It isn't accident. It isn't happenstance. He's doing it on purpose. He's putting the church where she needs to be, where she will be the most effective. He's placing people in the church where they will be the most effective. And the intention is for us to come safely through the storm. But in that, again, I, I just i got to be careful here because sometimes, I shared with you last week, or maybe it was the week before, most Christians' goal is heaven. Well, that's a good goal. But the reason they want heaven is because they want an escape from this place. I don't want to be here anymore. I want out. Just get me out of here. If that's your attitude, you've misunderstood what he's done. You just you've misunderstood. The storm that's coming, we're supposed to be part of it. We're supposed to fight in it. We are the ecclesia of God. We are those who occupy. We are those who He's called to be here. And not only just to occupy, but to take the bounty. You have to understand kingdoms of the earth, they fight over things like gold and they fight over oil and they fight over, they fight over resources. There's only one resource God's interested in, and that's the souls of men and women. That's the resource we fight for. It's the resource heavenly armies are fighting for. It's the resource the demonic armies fight for. They want the souls of men and women. See, God is calling people together. He's calling groups of people together. He's called us together, this family. So I ponder these things. I just see pictures in my mind's eye. and I, I'm old enough to remember back when, when people were leaving different parts of the world, they make these little flotillas, and they just all lash all their rafts together, and they'd head out in the open sea, and it's like, oh, Lordy, you fellas got a lot of faith. But you know what? That's what we need to do. We need to lash our boats together. We need to stand with each other. That, friends, is what a congregation is. See, when you've got an escape plan, well, if this doesn't work, then I'll just go do that. You're not trusting God. Our lives are intertwined with each other. They should be intertwined with each other. We need each other. And we will need each other more as we see the day approaching. If, if you unlash your boat, you're going to try to navigate the sea on your own. Don't do that. It was never God's plan for you to do that. We need each other and we carry each other in our hearts. If, if you were here Wednesday night, you saw this in action. See, there's an unusual spiritual pressure in the air now, and a lot of people are starting to recognize it. It seems like, man, I've been under more spiritual pressure or spiritual attack or trouble from the devil than I remember in a long time. Those who were here Wednesday night, we prayed for them. We locked arms with them. We joined our faith with their faith. We surrounded them with prayer. You were not meant to walk this alone. You were meant to walk with him and with your other brothers and sisters. 
God has called us to take our stand, but he's called us to take it together. When the church rises up, she will crush Satan under her feet. It doesn't just mean our church. It means our church comes together as one. And the other churches come together as one. And we now, as the body of Christ, stand up and take our place. The danger that is in this hour right now, the danger all of you face, is thinking that you've got a better shot at navigating what lies ahead on your own. There's a real danger in that. What happens is you start thinking, you know what, I've got to do this, I've got to get out of here, I've got to go there, I've got to... Well, I don't like that pastor, he's not. He's just not been good to me. He doesn't... I don't like him. Well... I'm sorry. And what happens is when things start going wrong, we start unlashing our boat just a little bit. Let a little more slack out. I get a little bit farther away. Friends, don't deceive yourself. What you need to do is check the slack in the line and tighten things up, not loosen them. Just being honest with you. God has provided safe passage through the storm. But your job is to make sure you don't drift away from the boat. I hope you hear what I'm saying. Matthew 24, verse 37, Jesus says this. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be the coming of the Son of Man. I think people forget. I think we forget because we want to forget. I think we forget because it's convenient to forget. God did not take Noah out. He didn't take Noah out. He took Noah through. But that's not what the church wants. We want, we want, we want God to take us out before. We're looking for the escape plan. Stop looking for the escape plan. God took Noah through the disaster that befell mankind. And he took him through in a boat. And the only ones that were saved were the ones who were on that boat. Everyone else, everyone else perished. Men's hearts are hard because we think we know better. I think I can navigate those waters better. I think that this big old boat's going to get destroyed in this storm, and if I can get in that lifeboat, i got a much better shot. You don't. You need to stay with the plan that God's orchestrated for your life. The Bible says that Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came. And God sealed him up in the ark with his wife and his three sons and their wives. It's a total of eight people. I suppose it's possible for a man of 600 years old, living at a time in history where men were prolific, they had lots and lots and lots of kids, Lots and lots of kids. And at 600 years old, I suppose it's possible he only had three children. But I don't think that's likely. I think it's far more likely that Noah had many children. I think he had a bunch of children. But children who were unwilling to stay with the plan that God had. Children who didn't want to stay with the boat. The old man's crazy. I ain't going to go out and build that boat with him. He's nuts. Guys, I implore you, stay with the boat. There's, there's a time in everybody's life where you see the eject plan, right? You, you, it's like things got really bad. All we got to do is drop the lifeboat and we're going to be okay. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. Look, I get it. Sometimes things in life don't go the way we expect them to go. I get it. Sometimes we get mad at God because he didn't do things the way we thought he should. He should have intervened and he didn't. And I'm mad. Stay with the boat anyway. You don't know what's going on. You don't know all things. Maybe just get over yourself. 
Maybe you've been fighting for a long time. Long time. Seems like every time you get your head above water, there's another something to pull you back down and you're just tired. I get tired too sometimes. Stay with the boat anyway. Anyway. I think of people who might be listening to this message online or on the internet. Thinking, I don't know how to stay with the boat. I don't, I don't have a boat. Where's my boat? You know, if you don't have a boat, you can be part of this boat. It's okay to be part of this boat. But if God's called you to another boat, and you're trying to jump between boats, you better stop. You better find out where he called you to be, and you better be there. You need to be there. You're not going to make it on your own. This storm that's coming, I don't have a better word for it because that's what it is. We'll talk about it a little more next week. I I feel like the Lord wants me to share some of the things that He's shown me. But you're already tasting pieces of it. There's spiritual pressure that's on the increase. It's on the rise. There's a resistance to many people's faith that they just haven't known before. And it's like, where's God and why isn't He helping? Again, nothing to worry about, nothing to be afraid of. So long as you stay with the boat. That's His plan and His guarantee. Stay with the boat. I don't don't know how to express to you. Men's hearts are hard. They just are. And that means that we think we know best. I know best. And I want God to jump onto my plan in my boat instead of me just staying on his boat. I don't know, have you ever considered Adam and Eve? The sin of Adam and Eve was not the fruit that they ate. I don't get mad at me. Food goes in the mouth and comes out the body. The sin was their heart. Sin was what the position of their heart was. See, the truth is they wanted to be like God, separate from God. I want to be like Him, I just don't want to involve Him. I want to be independent. That is the sin of men. We want to do it our way. The sin of the sailors on the boat. They wanted the salvation that Paul was talking about. They just wanted it independent of God. God's way has always been for us to carry one another in our hearts. I can't carry you in my heart if you walk away. Wednesday night was sweet for me. Because this is the church in action, lifting up our brothers, surrounding them. You know, if you remember Job, the devil complained to God. He said, you put a hedge of protection around him that I can't get through. What if that hedge of protection was your brothers and sisters? Yeah, you can have them, but you've got to get through me first. That's how we're to walk. i tell you a secret. After the service this morning... We're going to have the prayer team come up and they will join arms with you too. They'll join their faith with your faith if you want them to. And they'll pray for you and stand with you. It's odd to me. It really is a good prayer team up here. Rarely does anybody come up. It's because we think we can do it better on our own. Well, I got this. We'll wait till it gets really bad. Then we'll involve God. Okay. Let's be honest, though. This really, this reveals another problem that we have in American churches. More and more people are gravitating to an internet-based church. Read an article this week that said the next big thing is church in the metaverse. Pastors are building digital churches. And digital people are joining digital churches. They like that because, because, well, things don't go the way they want. They can just flip the off switch and now I'm out. No commitment on my part. Look, I don't know how that works. Well, I, technologically, I know how it works. 
I don't know how it works spiritually. Here's what I do know. I do know if you show up here, the power of God's here. The power of God's here because He's enthroned on our worship and on our praise. He's here because we invite Him here. His presence, His tangible presence, it's here. It's in this house. Now, maybe His tangible presence shows up in the metaverse too. I, I, it's above my pay grade. I don't know. But I find it interesting that what people are looking for today is simply forms. They want church independent of church relationship. They want the pastoral covering independent of pastoral leadership. They want the power of God independent of God. When they're done, they're going to find themselves with a form of church and a form of godliness that lacks power. It's a pipe dream. It's a mirage. It's not real. You have to ask yourself, what is it I really want? Do you really want God? Is that really what you want? Do you really want His presence? Do you really want to walk with Him? I can't answer that for you. See, some people, that's just not really what they want. What they want is they want to go to church and sell their Amway and sell houses and get hooked up with a bunch of networking people and do some stuff, do some business. Those people will be disinclined to stay with the boat when the storm comes up. One day Jesus preaches a message. And I'll be straight with you, it was a pretty hard message. It was a message that the people who claimed to be his followers simply could not embrace. He tells them this, John 6, 53, Unless you eat my flesh, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Dude, that's weird. In fact, I think that's wrong. That sounds pagan. Yeah, I can't, I can't. Jesus slipped. I don't know what happened. He's not making any sense anymore. The Bible says that from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And then Jesus will turn to the twelve. And he asks them a simple question. Do you want to leave me too? Don't know if you see the picture here. See, a whole bunch of people lashed their boat to his. And then this message came. And everybody starts untying their boats before things get weird. See, they were ready to ride out the storm with Jesus until he said that. Now they're looking for plan B. Their decision is that they'll do better on their own. But Simon Peter answers Jesus with wisdom, with insight. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. John 6, 68, 69. See, Peter made a choice. He decided to stay with the boat. It was a critical choice. The soldiers who cut the ropes that day, sending that lifeboat into the sea, they decided we're going to stay with the boat. Noah and his family. Well, again, I can't speak to all his family because I don't, the Bible doesn't say. But certainly three of his boys decided we're going to stay with the boat. Even the children of Israel, man, what a, what a stiff necked bunch they were. Grumbling all the way. But you know what? They never did return to Egypt. They never did go back to Egypt. 
They talked about it all the time. They whined about it all the time, but they stayed with the boat. See, when, when you're in the desert and the cloud moves, there was no, there was no, hey, on Thursday we'll be, you know, send out some emails. So, cause of Thursday we're all heading out. You woke up in the morning and the cloud that was over you is now a little bit off in the distance. That means it's time to strike camp. Time to get yourself ready because God's moving to a new place. To not go with the cloud would be certain death. You just need to understand that. The cloud protected them from the sun during the day, and the pillar of fire protected them at night. you got to stay with the cloud. you got to stay with the boat. This is the word that I'm hearing from the Lord in this hour, and the reason, the reason that I take it seriously, see, I intend to stay with the boat. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's already cut in stone. There's no question for me. I've already cast my lot. But God wouldn't be speaking these things to me if there were others who had not cast their lot. He wouldn't be telling me, you need to tell the people to stay with the boat if there weren't people thinking, I I need a better exit plan. If they weren't already examining their exit strategy, I'm just telling you, friends, stay with the boat. Where else are you going to go? Who else has... The Word, not me, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, who has the Word of eternal life. He alone has the strength to bring you through. Nobody else can. I promise you, you're not going to do it on your own. He alone has the Word of eternal life. What that means is, you are going to have to be like the centurion on the boat that day. You can't tell me it didn't take guts for him to cut the ropes and let that lifeboat go into the sea. That was a lifeboat he could have been on too. At some point, you have to make a decision. He made a decision. We will survive with this boat or we will die with this boat, but we are staying with the boat. I encourage you, friends, put your doubts aside. Put your trust back in God. He brought you this far. He's orchestrated your life to this point. He brought you here to this very time and hour and season for the battle that lies ahead. And he didn't bring you here to fail. He didn't bring you here so you could hide in caves and eat MREs. He brought you here to be victorious. That's who we are, the victorious church. Yeah, we forgot how to use our sword, and maybe we don't even remember where we put it. And sometimes we spend an awful lot of time fighting our brothers and sisters instead of fighting the enemy. But that's okay. The hour we're in, he's going to teach us what it is to fight. And he will bring us through victoriously. Not somehow, victoriously. But you got to stay with the boat. Jesus, help us. Father, help me stay with the boat. Father, help me to lay down my life and to take up your life. Help me to be the man you've called me to be, the person that you want me to be. Father, help me to walk in step with you, understanding the times and the seasons that I find myself in. What a great honor to live in this hour in history and to be part of the things that you have orchestrated for this time. Thank you, Father. Help me now to rise to that occasion. Help us as a church to rise to that occasion. Help this people rise to that occasion. Father, I pray that you would soften our hearts. We need soft hearts. Father, I pray that you would Help us see that it's only in you will we make it. It's only through you and by your direction that we will make it. So, Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you, Father, for the plan to bring us through. And Father, I pray that you would help us to lay hold of that for which Christ laid hold of us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I hope that's not too hard. Next week, I'm going to share some other things with you that may get your attention a little more. We'll see what the Lord does. Brother, you got the the word? 
So if the band wants to come, we'll prepare for communion. I want you to understand something. Communion is for the believer. It's a statement. Guys, it's a statement of you being found in him. This is exactly what Jesus said. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So I invite you to come up as the band sings the song. Take your communion, bring it back to the to your chair, and we will receive it together. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be broken for you. Do this in memory of me. When the supper was ended, he took the cup. And again he gave thanks, and he gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink it. This is the cup of my blood, which will be shed for you, that your sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Father God, we pray for a spirit of unity, a spirit of love and service for one another, that we may stand together as the storm comes we may be bound together as one in you, in Jesus' name. Now you know what Jesus was referring to. He said, I should eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood. This is usually the part in the service where I say, if I caused you trouble, I'll be up here. That, that is true. I say it was too hard for you. But you know what I shared with you today? It's not too hard. This is not too hard for you. It's time for us to grow up.